session, and that will be made available probably later today. But with that, I'm going to turn things over to Casey Shiley. Good morning. Thank you so much, Daryl, and welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me today. Um, it's exciting. I know for those of us who've um, been around for, for more than the last couple of years, we've been missing our in-person workshops. And so um, hopefully those will resume next year for 2023. So in the meantime, I thought that I would just have a webinar to cover some basic information, um, especially because we have a lot of new youth services and adult services staff um, who are, you know, planning their very first summer program ever. Um, and so I would love it if you all would take just a quick minute and introduce yourself in the chat and let us know which library you're from. And if this is your first um, summer library program that you're planning or that you're a part of, let us know that too. So that way um, we can try to make sure we throw some extra support in your direction. As Daryl said, my name is Casey Shiley. Uh, for those who have not had a chance to talk with me or meet me yet, I am your statewide youth services consultant for the Florida Library Youth Program, which we frequently call FLIP. Um, and uh, yes, I do use a lot of FLIP puns and I apologize. Um, it probably won't stop though. <laughs> so, um, so today we're gonna cover some basics of the Summer Library Program. We're gonna talk about the theme and slogan in the Illustrator. Um, you know, again, I know some of you who've been around for a while, some of this information is not going to be new to you, but I do know that we have some new people who, you know, have just walked into this within the last month and they're having to pick up and start from scratch. So I think any information and help and tips and tricks we can provide to them to help uh, is always greatly appreciated. Um, I love an active chat. So if you have questions at any point, by all means, feel free to put them in the chat. Feel free to share any resources that you think might help other people. Um, and as Daryl said, uh, you know, you can always click that hand raise button because I also love it when my voice is not the only voice. Um, if you have questions that you'd rather ask out loud and we will read those out loud to make sure that they are captured in the recording for those who are watching this later. So today we're gonna, um, as I said, we're gonna talk about just the brief overview of the Summer Library Program. Um, then we're going to talk about some tips for planning and the partnerships and outreach. Uh, and again, I know that for some of you, you might have already completed your planning for the summer and some of you are just now getting started. So hopefully um, some of these tips and tricks will either help you this year or maybe file them away for next year. And then we're going to look at some CSLP and some FLIP resources that are available to you all. And then we're going to talk about some program ideas. Um, I pulled some of the programs from the manual that I just particularly liked. Um, and then I found some other ideas for really appropriate. And we're also sort of fortunate because we have a lot of awareness and celebration days that are related to the theme that fall during the summer. And so we'll talk about those as well, just to give you some extra inspiration. So first off, our theme is oceanography and the slogan is Oceans of Possibilities, um, which is quite perfect for Florida. I feel like we are really uh, well equipped to handle this theme. Um, even if you're further inland and maybe you're not sitting on the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean, um, odds are that you're probably really close to a river or a lake or a creek or a swamp or some other sort of waterway. Um, that you can pull off of to really localize this theme. And our illustrator this year is Sophie Blackall, who is a Caldecott Medal winner. She's also won the Golden Kite Award for picture book text. Um, here's some pictures of some of the books that she's been a part of. Um, she and Kate DiCamillo just very recently uh, released The Beatrice Prophecy. Um, she also appeared at our annual CSLP Collaborative Summer Library Program meeting um, and spent some time with the state reps, and she was just such a lovely individual, um, and, and she was so sweet, and she told this really amazing story about how when she and Kate D. Camilla were working together, she, um, Sophie Blackall, had, had become sick, 
and um, she was so sick, she just didn't feel like doing anything. So Kate DiCamillo would actually call her up and read to her so that she could just have a moment of enjoyment. And I just thought that was just the sweetest story, um, you know, from two really well-known children's authors who are very supportive of libraries just working together. Um, so that again, just sort of a brief overview of moving forward. And so, um, as I said, I know some of you might already be completely done planning, uh, but I am going to go over just some tips for those who are maybe still working on it um, or those who might still be finishing up. And again, for those of you who've been doing this a while, feel free to add to these tips and tricks in the chat. Um, share your wealth of knowledge because I know that across Florida, we are incredibly fortunate to have very creative um, youth services staff who are really good at, you know, coming up with, um, you know, ways to overcome challenges, ways to make things happen when maybe the resources are scarce. So please feel free to share. But for those who are getting started, um, I find it helpful if you identify your goals and your objectives from the start. You know, think of Think ahead to your summer program and ask yourself, you know, what does success look like for you? Is it a numbers result? Is it if you get so many attendees? Is it, um, you know, offering a certain amount of programs? Is it offering certain types of programs? You know, what does that look like for you? And let that sort of help guide some of your decisions. And quality over quantity, I think, is especially important right now. Um, you know, for those of you who have been around more than the last three years, I know sometimes I find myself trying to hold myself to the same standards that I had three, four years ago, even though my resources aren't what they were three or four years ago. And so, you know, really think about what are you able to realistically do right now? Um, and it's okay if you have to come to the conclusion that you can't maybe offer the same number of programs you've offered in the past, or maybe your programs aren't on such a large scale because you just don't have those resources. Um, and and it, give yourself permission if, if you need to, because I, I don't know about you all, but I know that I tend to be really hard on myself um, and so just remember that we are still living in a very different world and that's not going to change anytime soon. And it's okay to have to maybe cut back on the quantity if it means that your quality is, is where you want it to be. Um, and I'm not going to read through every single one of these, but I did want to point out just a couple more that I think are really, really, really vital. Um, Creating a cheat sheet in case you're unavailable, I think is really important. Um, you know, especially right now, you never know when somebody might end up having to be out on extended leave. During my last summer program, when I was working in the field, I was very pregnant and I was due in the middle of July. And so I knew that there was a very strong chance that I might be out um, for a good, Part of our summer programming and so I created a binder that had everything that anybody would need to know if someone just had to step in and pick up um, you know pick up where I left off and that way they wouldn't have any unanswered questions and they would be able to do it um, so I, I think especially now because we don't know when people are going to be out um, you know and, and that's even in the best of circumstances um, so definitely think about that cheat sheet and those instructions if somebody else needs to, to step in. Um, and then considering accessibility and equity, I know that this has, you know, really become um, at the core of a lot of conversations with programming, not just for summer programming, but for, you know, any kind of programming within the libraries, the types of resources. Um, but I think thinking about those ahead of time and making a plan is going to help you better prepare yourself in your library for making um, any changes you might need to make in order to be more accessible. I am curious for some of you who have really, um, really jumped into your planning already, or maybe you're done. Um, what changes, if any, have you made 
so that your programs are more equitable, they are more accessible. Are you advertising ahead of time on your flyers that accommodations can be made? Um, so I would love to hear if anybody, you know, has really taken that step further to um, really advertise that your programs are accessible, are equitable. Partnerships is another conversation that I think comes up a lot when people are planning their summer program. You know, and the question is always, how do we make partnerships? How do we build partnerships? What partnerships do we focus on? Um, and, you know, I think partnerships are just like any other relationships. And so they follow that same formula, which means there really is no one way to build a partnership. Um, and just like any other relationship, sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. Um, I think what's helpful when deciding who you want to approach for a partnership is to look at those shared goals. Are there organizations and agencies in your community where your goals align with theirs? And then whenever you do decide to approach somebody, make sure that you're making it about what you can do for them more than what they can do for you. I think that's gonna go a long way of getting more buy-in when you can approach a potential partner to say, we're doing this, you know, we're having this program which aligns with your goals and we would love to work with you to help you reach those goals through our resources. Um, you know, or maybe it's a marketing thing, you know, the library can give them a lot of marketing at no cost if they are willing to donate or be a part of something. Um, and so, you know, make it about them. And then of course you wanna balance being persistent without being pushy. And I know that we work in a profession with a very high percentage of introverts. Um, and so I know it can be sometimes hard when you feel like just making an ask is being pushy. Um, but you know, again, it comes down to building those relationships and knowing if, um, you know, the, the organization that you are reaching out to just really does not have the resources to partner or maybe you just need to keep following up because they have a lot going on and they, you know, can't quite keep up. And I think offering layers to your ask is also helpful. So if you want to partner with a local business, um, you know, and let's say you are going in because you would really love for them to sponsor the cost of bringing in a performer, right? And that could be a really big ask. So maybe when you approach them, you know, you approach them with, hey, we're looking for businesses to sponsor programs. Here is the cost for that. Um, if you're not able to do that, would you maybe consider donating an incentive that we give out if your library gives out incentives? Or would you be willing to donate some give a business who can't reach you on your big goal, but may be able to help a little bit. Um, establish that partnership, so maybe moving forward in future summer years, they might be able and willing to, you know, up their, their sponsorship or up their partnership. And be specific. Um, you know, know exactly what you want to ask these partners for, because I think if you are more ambiguous, it's going to be easier for them to put you on a back burner. Um, so make sure that by the time you reach out to a potential partner that you, um, that you know exactly what you would like from them and how that's going to benefit them um, and how it's going to benefit you. And I do see that the chat is filling up. I love it. Um, so there are some folks who are scheduling or who are uh, sharing some of their program ideas. They're sharing information on how they set up those uh, program ideas. I'm not going to go through and read them all, but I did just want to point that out, that that is happening in the chat. So who do we partner with? Um, that's another common question. So I think some of these potential partners are, I think, on the more obvious end, 
um, any kind of your you know educational facilities, your schools, your camps, daycares, your summer programs, summer school. Um, and we will talk about schools in a little bit, just because I know that some communities have a really strong relationship with their local schools. And I know that some other communities have had a really difficult time kind of getting their foot in the door with their schools. Um, and so we'll talk about just some tips for, for trying to establish that relationship in a, in a little bit. Um, think about your local so social service agencies. You know, I know a lot of libraries right now are really trying to put a focus on mental health resources for their communities um, and their kids. And, you know, it's such a, it's always been a need, but now, especially over the last couple of years, those needs have grown. So think about, you know, what social service agencies do you have in your community that you might be able to reach out to? Do you have, you know, a local foster parent community that's very strong and maybe there's a way for you all to partner together um, that way? Do you have, um, you know, a really strong early learning coalition and maybe there's partnership opportunities there? Um, and I know that for some communities, a lot of their social service agencies are not actually located in is located physically in their community. So, you know, you may not have a local social security office, but maybe there's something that you can do um, even if they're not physically located in your community. You know, local businesses, again, I think this is easier in some communities than others because some businesses are really struggling right now. Um, so maybe where in the past you might have asked for them to either donate money or donate goods, maybe it's providing an opportunity for you to pass out flyers at their business if they're not able to financially contribute to your program this year or sponsor part of your program. I love when I hear about libraries partnering with retirement homes um, because this doesn't just have to be an adult services partnership. Um, I don't know about you all, but I've seen so many articles that just make my heart warm and fuzzy where um, some retirement homes have implemented story times with, uh, you know, local kids who aren't necessarily the grandkids or great grandkids of those who are, are at the retirement home, but it's bringing those multi-generations together um, at the retirement home. And so even if you are just strictly a children's services uh, library staff member or teen library staff member, consider your local retirement homes because that's sort of a win-win for everybody or maybe it is something like planning a family day where the library is gonna be there. Um, you know, think about local pediatrician, family physicians, um, and then your parks and rec departments, which I know a lot of libraries, especially over the last few years, have really built up those relationships so that they could start doing programming outdoors where people can distance. Um, and again, um, folks are throwing ideas out into the chat, 4-H clubs, health department, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, EMS departments, uh, those are all great ideas. Olivia shared um, that she is asking the local Coast Guard auxiliary, auxiliary to have a program for that, which is fantastic. Again, thinking of the theme, um, local state parks, uh, you know, there's so many potential opportunities here. And definitely share your favorite partner in the chat if you have one. Um, something else that I heard uh, somebody once upon a time mention is that they reach out to their community's local homeowners associations um, because some of them, you know, they have regular meetings that are very well attended. And so I've heard of some people attending these HOA meetings just to advertise and talk about the resources of the library. So that might be, you know, another another opportunity there that's a little outside the box. 
And so our, our lovely schools, our, our school personnel who have been under tremendous stress over the last several years, as I know we all have. Um, and so I know that it can be really difficult to establish a new partnership if there's not one already in place because they are so overwhelmed. And, you know, for those of you who have been able to establish a really strong school partnership, um, again, please share any tips or tricks you have. Um, so I, I definitely recommend finding a singular staff member that could really be your foot in the door if you had a hard time. Um, obviously, you know, I think at least my first step would be the school media specialist because that's a very organic relationship, I would think. Um, but especially right now, I know a lot of um, special area teachers are really getting pulled in many directions, more so than ever before. And so while they might be the media specialist or they might be the PE coach because there's so many teaching shortages, it's quite possible they are getting also pulled in so many different directions. So consider, you know, is there a reading teacher or a reading coach? Um, you know, some schools have multiple reading coaches on top of their media specialists. So maybe that's a more natural partnership and maybe they have the ability to really work with you on how to partner a little bit more than maybe the media specialist. Um, you know, and, and don't forget the principal or the assistant principal or um, some schools, in addition to principals and assistant principals, they also have a dean of students. And so, um, you know, if, if you've tried to reach out to the media specialist and you haven't had um, great success because maybe they are just um, too, too spread thin right now, or maybe you are in a district where they don't have media specialists, consider the other staff members at the school and who else might be um, that good point of contact that you can really establish that relationship with. And I also think that you should consider the makeup of your local schools um, because they're going to be very different, which means they're going to have very different priorities. Uh, depending on the size of your community and how many different schools you have, I know here in Leon County we have many different elementary schools they are all very different from each other. Um, you know, the, the demographic makeup is very different. The socioeconomic makeup is very different, which means the challenges at these schools and the, you know, the, the priorities that they have academically are probably going to differ a bit. Um, and so I think that whenever you are approaching a specific school, um, it might help you to know what that specific school has identified as their priority. Are they struggling with their reading scores? Um, and so they are implementing new initiatives to bring that up. Are they really wanting to focus on STEM? Um, and then figure out how you can fit what you're doing into helping them. Because again, it's going back to that, um, you know, here's what I can do for you, not just what you can do for me. Because the great thing is that the schools are a fantastic opportunity to um, market your summer library program before they break for school. And so, you know, if you can establish that relationship ahead of time, and then you can get that information out. Um, and there's many different ways you can do that. Um, one of the things that we did at my library is that we would get the um, summer program uncut bookmarks and then we would print out our entire summer schedule on the back of them and every elementary school student in the county went home with a bookmark with our schedule on the back um you know some some of you all drop flyers off some um are able to get out there for their morning announcements um, consider social media too, right? I know that a lot of libraries do tremendous work on their social media to use that for marketing programs. Reach out to your local schools and see if they are willing to share your social media content or maybe create social media content for them to share out. Um, if, you're, if the school doesn't have an active social media presence, See if they have a school parent-teacher organization, PTO or PTA, if they have one. Um, I know just as a parent, that's my, you know, my children's school. Um, 
the school itself does not use social media, but we have a very active PTO uh, social media presence. So, um, you know, or consider going all the way up to the district and see if they would be willing to share information out on their social media. And then of course, if you can get your school leadership to really buy in, maybe they're willing to offer some sort of incentive for kids who participate when they come back to school. Um, we had one local principal who was so invested in children participating that he offered a pizza party at the start of the school year for any kids who brought in a signed uh, reading certificate or reading log from the library showing that they had participated. Um, and so even if, you know, maybe it's just acknowledging these students in their school newsletter or Um, you know, middle and high schoolers, that's when they start getting really competitive if you have multiple rival schools. Um, so maybe make it a competition to see which high school can have the most participation. Um, and if you have a superintendent or school principals who are willing to go all out, maybe they're willing to, to put something on the line, like take a pie to the face for which high school gets the most participation or, or you know, however you set up your local um, program. So, I, you know, think fun, think outside the box, um, maybe take baby steps if that's what you need to do. Um, but, you know, which kid doesn't love a love to see their teachers or their principal get a pie in the face? <laughs> so outreach and marketing, you know, it's just like building partnerships, there isn't one magical answer. There's not one magical platform that is going to get you the outreach and marketing success that you need or want. Um, it's using a bunch of different types of platforms. It's using a bunch of different types of methods and really figuring out what works best for your community because every community is going to be different. Some communities have a lot of luck with virtual and digital marketing. Other communities have better luck running an ad in the local newspaper. Um, it really just depends on what's gonna work best. Um, but use many different types of platforms, many different methods, at least three, um, because you're gonna reach different people in those different areas. And I think it's really helpful to write out your social media and marketing plan, so that way you, you can sort of see the big picture as you're going through it. Uh, CSLP also does have a social media toolkit um, that is available to, you know, all of our members who have purchased access to the manual. Uh, we'll take a sneak peek at that here in a minute because um, it is behind the manual access. Um, and as a reminder, if your library bought only bought a print or a USB or a physical type of manual, you still have access to the online manual. Um, and again, so I'm also, I'm not going to read through all of these, um, but I do want to, you know, share, consider your local newspapers and your local TV stations. A lot of times they're looking for local content to share. I know in recent years, a lot of newspapers have, um, you know, sort of combined and your local newspaper's office may not be physically located in your community. Um, but they are still probably looking for local events, local news. Um, and you just want to look at those ahead of time to see what sort of lead time do they need. Um, for some newspapers or TV stations, it might be a couple weeks, it might be a couple months. Um, a lot of times you can just go on their websites and see, you know, what the steps are to submit a news article. Um, and then I think creating a contact list with notes will go a long way in sort of helping you keep yourself organized. But also, you know, as you move forward with future summer programs and future programs in general, um, you know, I think it's easier to kind of remember who you spoke with, where, what was the outcome of that conversation. Um, so I would love, uh, if you would, for those who, who've done this before, share your most successful outreach activity in the chat or your most unusual outreach activity in the chat because i always love a good out of the box 
um, outreach or marketing activity. And Casey, while we do that, um, there's been some mic issues going in and out. It could be internet connection related, but if you want, we, you could switch to the uh, headset mic and see if that's better. I will, um, I just move the microphone closer to me and I will also relocate my paper to the other side of the table and see if that helps maybe. Maybe okay. I'm creating noise that's interrupting. Right, yeah. I, yeah, I was thinking first it was internet related because for whatever reason, those internet connections in there. But hmm. we can try that first and then if you want, we can go to the headset after that. That'll work. Okay, good. Um, does anybody have any questions before we move on to looking at some resources that are available to you? And again, you can either post those in the chat or you can hit that hand raise button. All right. So let's talk resources. And I will I will preface this section by saying this is not you know an exhaustive list of resources uh, you know there's certainly more out there so again feel free to to share if you have found something particularly um, fun or helpful so let's talk about the collaborative summer library program and again for those who are new and you're maybe looking at this going who is CSLD. Um, they are the national organization that we purchase subscriptions for, for every public library in the state of Florida to participate in the, the big national summer library program theme. Um, that gives us access to purchasing the manual. Um, and we do have an entire webinar that we did with Luke Kralik from CSLP that talks more in depth about CSLP. When I send my follow-up email for this, uh, this webinar. I will also include that um, if you are curious to learn more about them. But I do want to point out, so in addition to the manual, they also have other summer reading resources on their website that might be helpful for you all. Um, if you pull up their website, there is a drop-down menu that I've screenshotted here. So if your library has been interested in learning more about summer food programs, um, or if you're looking for more inclusion resources, they have that. Um, they also have some tutorials about using the manual. And um, I know in the past they've released, um, closer to summer, they've released video PSAs, public service announcements, and they've released tutorials on how to add your library information to the end of those. Um, so that's another great place to look. And then, in case you didn't know, there's also a National Summer Reading Champion every year that they announce that has not yet been released for 2022. But for 2021, um, the, the official National Reading Summer Reading Champions were the guide dogs for the blind, which was really fun, I think. Um, so take a look on their website if you're just looking for some of those additional resources that are not necessarily programmatic. But then of course, we do have the CSLP manual. Um, and I do wanna put out either a reminder for those who've been around or just share maybe some new to you information. The manual for the summer library program is created by volunteers from across the US and territories. Um, it's done via manual committee, um, but they also have a way for library staff to submit program ideas um, to that get added to the manual. And I will say that they have been known to continue to add resources and program ideas to the online manual as things come up. And so even if you did purchase a physical manual, I still encourage you every so often to maybe pop in there and see if they've added something new. Um, this, you know, the social media toolkit is one of those sections that will continue to grow as we move closer to the summer library program. Um, and then if something major happens, you know, three years ago, they added a whole lot of virtual programming resources on the fly because it became a necessity. Um, and so, you know, if for those who had a physical manual, obviously there was no way to add it to there. So 
just keep in mind that sometimes that manual will continue to evolve. And so it's worth it to pop in there every so often. And the manual also received a new look this year. Um, I happen to love it. I would love some feedback for those of you who have used the online manual in previous years and now um, you know, have used this year's. Um, I love how easy it is to use and um, how easy it is to find things. Um, so there is a way not only for you to search. So if you are looking for a specific item, um, you can, they've got that search box there, but then also they've got the drop down boxes, which are really nice because there's a lot of different categories. And I will show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, I did want to draw attention to how to find the social media toolkit because it's not really under a category that is easily found. Um, so I think that this is one of those uh, resources that is easier to find just by typing in social media toolkit. Um, and it'll pop up with the download. The download is actually just a Word doc that will um, give you the link to the Google Docs. Um, and so whenever you click on that link, it will take you to the Google Docs, which will look like this. Uh, so if your library does have, um, I know some libraries, their IT have banned Google Docs. Um, so if you really want some information out of there and you're having a hard time accessing it because it's behind a firewall, feel free to send me an email and I'll see what I can find to help you. Um, I, you know, I can maybe send you some of the information directly. Um, some of these areas, there's nothing in it just yet, but there will be. So again, check back periodically, especially if you just need some filler information um, to throw out on social media. And then here's what that drop down menu looks like when it's expanded. And I really like that you can look it up not only by age group, but by runtime. So if you just need maybe a 15 minute program as a filler, uh, runtime. And so I think it's really, really easy to use. It's easy to find things this way. Um, and it's kind of the best of both worlds. And then of course you can always you know, just download the entire manual if you wanted it in its entirety. They're also working on getting all the previous year's programs for the years that the theme that you really enjoyed or an activity that you remember pulling from the manual, um, you know, eventually you'll be able to go on and really, um, you know, dig into those if you if you would like. One other resource in the manual um, outside of programming that I wanted to draw your attention to is the book list. Um, for each of the chapters, they do have book list suggestions. Um, and so it's really helpful if you're just looking for some new inspiration or maybe you're stuck on a specific age group um, on what sort of books to offer or suggest. And then they also have some Spanish early literacy titles. Um, this is not the complete list. This is just a screenshot of one part of the page. Um, but I do know that the Spanish committee for CSLP are always looking for more resources. And so if you happen to be, you know, a very fluent Spanish speaker, um, I know that that Spanish committee is always looking for either new members or just new help, you know, more help finding new resources. Casey, you got a question. Um, Gabrielle is saying that the um, content is password protected. Is there a password that they need? It, it is. Your library has to purchase access to the manual, um, which if your library receives an allotment, that is one of those things that your allotment um, can go towards. And once you purchase either online access or the physical manual, you should receive an access code for that. Um, so, Danielle, I would find out who um, is responsible for ordering summer materials for your library and ask them about that. Um, if you can't figure out who that is, send me an email and um, my email address will come up again at the end of the webinar. Plus, I will also be sending you a follow up um, and I can help you track down that information. And so um, jumping back in. I'm also working on adding some resources to the FLIP webpage. 
Um, there's a couple things that are up right now, but then I also have some additional items that are currently in the process of going through approval. So if you come into my FLIP webpage and the summer program, and again, I will link you to these pages in my follow-up email. It's thinking. Um, I'm, I am working on creating some original content that's not necessarily items out of the uh, manual. So right now, where I'm highlighting two flip materials, I, you know, I created one of those, you know, little fun social media things, you know, what's your mer name, using your month of birth and the last number, um, you know, just something sort of fun that you can either download and stick out or you can use as an ice. Sending it through communications here, the staff that have seen it have had a fun time sort of um, figuring out what their mermaid name is. And it's coming up very slowly. Um, yeah, so just something, you know, kind of fun, something easy to grab. Um, and then also, you will see it at the towards the end of my webinar, but I did create a calendar of those um, celebration days to kind of know that align with um, with the summer theme. And then I will be adding to that. I'm working on creating some activity packets in conjunction with Florida Memory and just some extra things that you all can grab, you know, to either. Them into a program. I'm also working on some uh, social media graphics that you'll be able to go in and just download. Um, they're not library specific, they are not specific to a specific library, but they're just sort of library centric and Florida centric for the summer program as well, just for some easy content um, if anybody finds that helpful. And so I will make sure to make those announcements as stuff is added to the web page. So let's talk about some program ideas. And again, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to, to throw those in. Um, we're, we're down to about 16 minutes, so I'm trying to push along a little quickly so we don't run out of time. Um, I do wanna highlight a few program ideas from the manual. Um, I pulled out a program for each of the different age groups. I did not include all of the step-by-step -step instructions for these particular programs because they are in the manual and you can find them there. Um, so this one I thought was really cute because it's also really easy um, in the Uncharted chapter, the early literacy, um, having kids create a coral reef using Play-Doh and pipe cleaners, which I think every, children's youth services library staff member probably has in their closet. Um, what I liked about this is that this could be a standalone activity. It could be one of those things that kids work on as they're coming in and they're waiting for a story time or a program to start. Uh, you know, you could add beads that look like fish. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways to incorporate this. Um, but I know I, I appreciate Uh, materials, uh, easy cleanup, easy setup. Uh, in the discovered treasures, in the discovered treasures chapter, uh, one of the children's activities is a message in a bottle. Um, which one I what I love about this particular activity is it really could be, um, it really could be adapted for any age. You know, you could make it more complicated for a teen or an adult. Um, in the manual, they do have printable codes. Um, you know, you could have them decorate their bottles, have it be part craft, part learning about secret messages and ciphers. Um, you know, you could have them hide them around the library and turn it into a scavenger hunt. So there's a lot that you could do with this one program. Um, so I love a good versatile program as well. 
in the Seven Seas Infinite Stories in the teens, they were, you know, they have a coastal cosplay using oceanic characters. Again, this is the kind of program that can be as big or as small as you need it to be. If you can provide fabric and sewing supplies and actually have the creation be part of a program, that's an option. Um, if you don't have that ability, maybe it's having people show up already in costume. It's the kind of program that you can take virtual by just having them log on to your Zoom room or whatever you, know, whatever you use. Or even more sort of self-directed, you could just have them submit photos and maybe put it out on your social or put it up around the library for people to vote on. And uh, Casey, Nina asks, can we access handouts from this training? Yes, I will send you the, um, the PowerPoint, which is really about the only handout that I have. Um, but if there's something else you need access to, feel free to reach out to me and we'll, we'll figure out how to make that happen. The captain's log for adult programming, this is in the Explore New Depths chapter. Um, so you could have a program about the importance of captain captains or ship's logs, and then have a journal making program. Um, this, again, there are instructions in the manual for how to do this. I'm a very visual person, and so there are just certain activities and crafts that I could read the words and I can understand the words, but I'm so visual. So I did include a link to um, a particular kettle stitch book binding tutorial on YouTube. There's a million and one different videos if you wanted to see, um, you know, different methods of creating journals. Um, and again, this is one of those where it, it can be as fancy or as not fancy as you need it to be. And then the Our Blue Planet chapter deals a lot with, um, you know, conservation, uh, sustainability, and, and waterways. And so one of the all ages programs that they mentioned was, um, you know, having the library partner with a local park or conservation group to organize a community waterway cleanup. Um, this is also a great opportunity, you know, if you have teens who need volunteer hours. Um, but again, bringing community get together. Um, and if you are able to provide things like rubber gloves and trash and recycling bags. So whether that's your local, you know, you have a local park with a lake in it or a local river, or if you're on the coast, on the beach. Um, a lot of different ways to make this happen. And so some additional program inspiration that's not necessarily in the manual and I just thought was cute, um, creating jellyfish. Um, making jellyfish crafts, again, there's, there's 101 different ways to make this happen. Um, this particular one, it used, what I liked about it is that it used a lot of materials that I think most libraries probably already have on hand or could get um, easily and cheaply enough. Um, I'm not going to read through all the materials and all the instructions, but you know, you you cut your tissue paper in squares, or you can have the kids rip them up depending on your time. You glue it on there, poke a hole, stick some string in, and they used uh, ribbons, the self-adhesive ribbons. Um, but of course, you could use anything that you have on hand um, to make that happen. And who doesn't love a good googly eye, right? If you're wanting to go in a more STEM direction, I found this really fun looking layers of the ocean activity. Um, it's also a great way to teach about density if you are much smarter than I am. Um, I will say this particular to plan it out um, because you freeze green water into ice trays. Um, if those ice trays happen to look like fish or water creatures, how fun. Um, you also need to dissolve salt into water. And so, you know, if you have a microwave that you can make that happen, um, or if you happen to have a library that actually has a stove in it. Um, but I'm not sure if boiling water near kids is maybe um, something that people want to take on. Um, but you mix water and salt to create a very dense salt water. And then you mix in blue, blue food coloring. You want that water to come back to room temperature. So again, that might be a right, you know, a pre-programmed step. 
Um, and then you put in your sand, you put in your blue water, and then you throw some of your frozen fish, um, and then the ice will eventually melt. So this is an activity where um, you know you may want to sort of do it at the beginning of a program and then have them come back at the end of the program so you give your ice time to melt. Um, this could be a great virtual, you know, if you're doing a STEM families, then you can always speed up that melting process. Um, so it's sort of a fun way just to incorporate. So I, with permission, um, you know, some kind of a guess who program, this was adapted from the Pokemon at the pond. Um, for those of you who were in our programming potluck webinar a while back, this looks should look familiar. Um, Alexandra Phillips and Carlene Adams from St. John's County created this Pokemon at the Pond where they put out large silhouettes of Pokemon with clues. Um, and they gave patrons, um, for them it was a Pokedex to walk around and try to guess which Pokemon. So the idea is that you could use that same idea, um, but do water creatures and give out, you know, facts about water creatures, water animals. Um, and then you can either put them up around your library. If you have great outdoor space, you can laminate them and stick them out there. Um, if you have a great sort of main street walking area, I know some people have done book character scavenger hunts in a similar fashion and they've hidden them in the front windows of businesses. Um, and then, you know, have some incentive for them to bring the log back to you. So it's educational and it's sort of fun and it's one of those things that um, can hit any age group. And then ocean zones, sort of taking it back to the STEM. Um, and again, don't feel like you have to kind of like write this stuff down feverishly. I will send you uh, the PowerPoint so you will have all these materials and the steps. I've also included the links um, for where the activity came from if you just wanted, you know, more information. Um, so this activity focuses on the zones of the ocean and it creates um, a very visual representation for what that looks like, which is what I really liked. Um, again, I'm a visual creature. I like color. I like to be able to see the things that people are talking about. And it also requires very little in the way of resources and materials. You know, this is the kind of activity that either you could do a demonstration of in front of your group, or you could, you know, have enough materials for your um, patrons, your kids, your teens, whomever, um, to each make their own sort of ocean zones bottles. Um, but this person just used spice bottles and filled them with water and added food coloring. Um, on the kcadventures.com blog, she did include her, um, her formula for how much of each food coloring she put in, and that was based on her six ounces of water. So if you decide to do this program, that might be an area where you sort of pre-figure this out ahead of time so that, you know, when you're live in the program, you know exactly which bottle needs which. And then she just bought some little, you know, plastic water animal features to kind of throw in there and talk about which animals sort of, you know, live in each of the different zones. And then oceanography trivia. What I love about this is, again, it's it's one of those programs where you can hit any age group, really. Um, and it can be in person. It can be virtual. There's a lot of free trivia websites out there. Um, Kahoot is one that I know I've used and I really enjoy. Um, trivia maker, quiz maker. But if you don't want to use any of those, or maybe you are not allowed to use any of those, you, you know, you can also just use PowerPoint or Google Slides. Um, and so I, you know, I threw that in there because sometimes we just need sort of a, a low fuss, a low fuss activity. And then here's those of awareness and celebration days that I was able to find that sort of falls in line with our theme. Um, again, if you want to, you can go to the Flip web page and download that calendar um, 
the last time I checked, they had not yet announced when Shark Week was officially, but it's, it's usually in July. Um, so that might be something sort of keeping an ear to the ground about. Um, but we, you know, we have a lot of a lot of really fun days that I think could be incorporated or months. Um, and so I just wanted to include those in case any of you wanted to build programs around that. So again, you will get this resources, all these links. Um, if there was anything that particularly struck out or stuck out to you and struck you as something you want to pursue and, and maybe incorporate. Um, so I feel like I was talking very fast. I think I'm so used, we've had so many brainstorming sessions over the last few years that it's always, it still feels a little weird when I'm just doing a webinar <laughs> instead of having a full on conversation. Um, so are there any questions, any um, information that anybody would like to share? We have about three minutes. So I know that's not a lot of time for questions. Um, again, if you need to reach me and you don't have my contact information, it is up on the screen right now. Um, I love it when I hear from folks. And hopefully some of this information will help you as you sort of finish out your planning. Um, we do have three brainstorming sessions coming up over the next couple of weeks. I know two of those announcements have gone out. Um, one I think still needs to go out. So hopefully you all can join us for that. And that'll be a very interactive experience. Well, I'm not seeing any questions. And so um, I'm gonna stick around for about two more minutes. Um, but if you all need to jump off, feel free. Thank you again for hanging out with me for an hour. Um, I will get this follow-up email out to you as soon as I can with all the resources, um, but I hope you all have a great weekend and thank you. Um, one question, Casey says, do you recommend any resources online to get ideas for young adult programs? Yes. So, you know, obviously the manual is a good first step in looking at things that are specific to teens. Um, I've been spending a bit of time on Pinterest, which I know people either love it or they hate it. Um, I am also I am also working on building a Pinterest board specific to. Um, and then if you're on Facebook, there is actually a CSLP program planning group where people are sharing ideas there. Um, and that covers sort of all the age groups, but um, there is a lot of teen conversation because I think people find it, some, sometimes these themes lend themselves to the younger age groups a little bit better than the top. Um, I can also do some more research and see if I can find some more stuff to email out, if that helps. And then uh, Jennifer asked about uh, providing the transcript or recording of the webinar. Yep, you'll get the recording um, when I send out my follow-up email, as well as a copy of the slides. And then what is the name of the Facebook group? Oh, you know what? Let me look that up because I, if I try to pull it from my memory, I'm going to get it wrong. Um, I will send that in my follow-up email. I think they tend to change it with the theme, but the group stays the same. So it's something like CSLP, Oceans of Possibility, Planning, something, something, something. So I will link that to you to make your life so much easier just by clicking on a link. All right, well, we are at 11 o'clock right now. Um, so if you have any other questions that come up, feel free to email me or give me a call. Um, and hopefully I will see a lot of you online in the upcoming weeks in our brainstorming sessions. Thank you so much.